Thank you, Angela, and thank you, everybody, for attending and having me here. Um, so as Angela said, I'm Miranda Levy. I'm from the Northwest ADA Center. Uh, just briefly about me, um, I am a certified rehabilitation counselor. Um, I have a master's in rehab counseling, and I'm a um, certified ADA coordinator. Um, I do my little spiel about the Northwest ADA <laughs> Center. <laughs> uh, so we have a toll-free number that people call in and ask questions, 800-949-4232. There's a song. I'm not going to sing it. Um, <laughs> you, people email questions as well, so we respond that way and also through social media. Uh, we do trainings like this one. That's me. Um, we send out information through email and mail. Uh, we do research projects. Right now we're working on a five-year research project on uh, accessible medical care. Uh, and we do public awareness events like tabling at conferences and whatnot. Uh, we're actually, our overhead organization is CSER, the Center for Continuing Education and Rehabilitation. And we're affiliated with Rehab Medicine at University of Washington and grant funded by NIDLER, the National Institute on Disability and Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. <laughs> I said that really fast because, you know, it, yes, exactly, it's a mouthful. Uh, we're the Region 10 ADA Center in the ADA National Network. There's 10 ADA centers throughout the country covering all states and Puerto Rico and Guam. So that's that. Fair warning, I'm going to read the slides for maximum accessibility. Some people are visual learners, some people are audio learners. Some people find that dry, but too bad, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so today, our learning goals. We're going to do an overview of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, we're going to talk about the obligations of Title II entities, such as yourself. Uh, then we're going to discuss potential reasonable modifications at colleges, since that's what you are. Um, and questions and comments are definitely encouraged. Uh, you know, if you have specific scenarios or things like that, we can talk about that, and we'll, I'm going to try to leave time um, for Q&A at the end. Hopefully, we'll have that. But this is a safe space, and there is no judgment. Um, but certainly, if you're uncomfortable asking questions right now, talk to me after the session, or you can call or email me um, at a later time. I have cards over there, and I'll give you my contact information at the end of the presentation. So. The ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, there's five sections. Uh, Title I, employment. Title II, state and local government. And that's what we'll be talking about today, primarily focusing. Title III, places of public accommodation. So that'll be like your movie theaters, your hotels, your grocery stores. Title IV, telecommunications. And Title V, miscellaneous provisions. So that's where you see um, that people cannot be retaliated against for, say, filing a complaint, and that kind of thing. Now, what's the congressional purpose of the ADA? This is what the Department of Justice says. The purpose of the ADA is to provide a clear and comprehensive national mandate to end discrimination against individuals with disabilities and to bring those individuals into the economic and social mainstream of American life. The ADA is a Civil Rights Act meant to ensure equal access to programs and services. So I, I'm emphasizing this because the ADA is not an entitlement act. It's not saying that individuals are entitled to any particular services or goods. Um, it's just saying that um, they might uh, need some accommodations, but that's just so that they can have equal access to services, so that they can um, enjoy life, <laughs> services like anybody else who does not have disabilities, right? A little bit more about that. The civil rights protections to individuals with disabilities similar to those provided to individuals on the basis of race, color, gender, national origin, age, and religion. General overview of what a civil rights act is, right? Um, and it's often individualized for the person and the context, like jobs. Um, this kind of goes to, and I'll say this multiple times throughout this presentation, is that anything disability related um, 
uh, or often, it's not black and white. There's lots of gray areas here, you know? It's very case by case. So if you're gonna ask me questions, I'll probably say, probably like this, maybe, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I might not be able to give you a straight answer because it really is dependent on the situation, right? So, we had the ADA in 1990. That's when we originally got the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now in 2008, the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act happened. Why? Well, the original definition of disability, of course, was in the 1990 ADA. There were many court cases occurred throughout that time in those um, 18 years. And it eventually narrowed that definition, which was detrimental to individuals with disabilities. So Congress acted, what? And uh, eventually passed the ADA Amendments Act. And that clarified the definition of disability. It spelled out kind of what is the definition of what is a disability um, within that new piece of legislation. So now, what is the definition of disability? And this is actually your Washington State definition of disability, which I say for this presentation because whatever is the definition that provides broader access for people with disabilities, that's the one we're gonna use because that trumps the federal definition, right? Um, so this one is actually pretty much identical to the federal um, ADA definition, but regardless, um, since it's not narrower, we're gonna use this one. So the definition, um, as stated in the RCW, disability means the presence of a sensory, mental, or physical impairment that one, is medically cognizable or diagnosable, or two, exists as a record or history, or three, is perceived to exist whether or not it exists in fact. So that's your three-pronged definition. And here's a question we get a lot. Um, did the ADA Amendments Act of 2008 change the definition of disability? We talked about that, how it clarified that definition, right? It did not, but it was clarified, like I said. And several types of disabilities that were not in the original ADA um, are specifically mentioned in the ADA, AA, such as psychiatric disabilities. Also, it clarified substantially limits, major life activities, episodic conditions, like uh, seizure disorders, for example, and mitigating measures. So it, it more clearly spelled these things out for people. Um, this, I mentioned the psychiatric disabilities, for example, because uh, now it's more black and white. Yes, a person with a psychiatric disability is a person with a disability. We could have assumed that based on the 1990 ADA, but it wasn't spelled out in black and white. So there was a lot of court cases because of that situation since it was not actually in writing. So now it's there. Um, just kind of reiterating this, disabilities under the ADAAA include but are not limited to psychiatric disabilities, cancers, HIV and AIDS, seizure disorders, respiratory diseases, diabetes, and infertility. So there's again some kind of ones that have been let in, some non-apparent disabilities that they added. Now we're going to move into the Title II issues. Do people have any questions so far though? because I just sort of did that overview. All right. So, Title II, state and local government. And that's what you all are, as we talked about. A public entity covered by Title II of the ADA is defined as any state or local government, any department or agency, state and local government, like colleges, universities, libraries, etc. Certain commuter authorities and Amtrak.
more on this, uh, Title II entities shall operate their programs so that when viewed in their entirety, they're readily accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. And they'll provide programs and services in an integrated setting and reasonable modifications in policies, practices, and procedures. So basically, this is saying that um, Title II entities will make these facilities accessible to people with disabilities. They're, they'll allow equal access for people with disabilities. More, um, the Title II entities will furnish auxiliary aids and services, meaning effective communication. So if somebody needs um, a pocket talker, they're hard of hearing, um, or uh, some other kind of communication device, or American Sign Language interpreter, something like that, that entity would most likely have an obligation to provide that. Uh, and, of course, they have to ensure that the individuals with disabilities are not excluded because the buildings are inaccessible. That would be program access. And naturally, the buildings have an obligation to be up to the building code, compliant with building codes, so that is something that those buildings would need to work on. If there are some building code issues, you would well work with that individual to see, okay, how can I assist them, support them to get into the building where they need to go, right? until they can fix the building code issue. A quick question for the class as we get into reasonable modification. <laughs> Do you know where to find your reasonable modification or accommodation policy and who to talk to about it? Anybody? Raise your hand. Everybody. Everybody who knows that. Almost everybody. So you know where to find it? You know where to see it? Yeah. I know where to find it on your website. Uh -huh. Okay. And you know who to talk to about it? Angela. Angela. <laughs> Good job. Okay. Yes. Angela, right there. Yes, I should have. Oh, shoot. We look similar enough. Yeah. You do, actually. Yeah. You kind of look like Hermione. I should have just put your face right there. All right. Good, gold stars for everyone. All right, nice work. How many accommodation policies do we have? Oh. Oh, so the question was, how many accommodation policies do we have? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. What is the answer, Angela? We have three. There's reasonable accommodations for students with disabilities, reasonable accommodations for employees with disabilities, and an incipient IT accessibility policy. Oh. So. It's kind of a trick because the third one's in development this year. Oh. So students, employees, and IT. Nice. Good work. Very interesting and informative. So colleges and providing reasonable modifications. Under Title II of the ADA, public higher ed institutions are obligated to provide reasonable modifications to students and visitors and parents or guardians. So if a parent is coming um, to check out the school with their kid or to um, watch them graduate or or whatever, sitting in a class, I don't know what they might do, watch them present something, anything, um, they, would, they would have an obligation to um, uh, provide them a reasonable modification of policy as well. Also, if the, um, you know, a student is normally responsible for requesting their own reasonable modification, but if that student, due to a disability, does need a, like a parent advocate, um, to assist them with that, but the, the parent also needs a accommodation, say like uh, an ASL interpreter, the school would also be responsible for providing that. So again. So just some examples here, and of course there is a much longer list, but I just put a few. Um, some modifications of policy for students, um, 
audiobooks, qualified note takers, extended test time, cart captioning. Um, can people think of any other ones that you may have used or that you know that your school uses? Accessible uh, computer desks that we have. Accessible computer desks that, that you might use, that you do use here? Any other ones? Accessible doors? Yeah. Accessible doors, yeah. Like a power door? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Um, writing for um, well, besides note, note taking, uh, writing. Scribing? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so there can be many accommodations, and, and you know, we just think of Think of things that you might not even have thought of because it's very individualized um, for the person, like we say, case by case. Some modifications yeah. for visitors, which also you might use the same ones as for students. Um, an ASL interpreter at, say, a graduation ceremony. Um, an installation of a temporary ramp because there might not be some at certain buildings. Um, Paperwork in alternative formats. Parents say have to fill out a bunch of that paperwork that parents need to fill out saying, you know, yes, I'll pay this amount or, you know, yes, I have this much income, I need to sign it, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, but they need it in large print. That, that's a modification for, um, for, my, for a parent, that sort of thing. Does anyone have any ideas, more ideas for visitors, parents? Anything you may have used? We have um, Braille. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Braille. Braille and tactile. Um, yeah, signage. Yeah, which is actually a building code requirement. So that's, but that's very good that you have that, of course. Yeah, and you can see that in the 2080 standards and then also in the um, International Building Code, which is the building code that we use in Washington State. Um, so you, you can see exactly what those numbers are supposed to look like. But well, it's very good that you notice that. I put this up here because I get this question a lot when I talk to colleges. What about marijuana? Ah, ha, ha, I know. Uh, what about marijuana? So smoking indoors, such as in the dorms, is illegal, uh, regardless of disability. So, if a student smokes medical marijuana and asks for a reasonable modification of policy so that they can token their room for medical purposes, the school is not obligated to give the thumbs up. Um, you all don't have dorms here though, right? No. Yeah. 2019. Yes. 2019. So, um, so it's coming up. Yeah. But I thought I would give that example anyway because, you know, as college folks, you, you might be interested. And, Regardless, I also know that um, you do have um, designated smoking areas, right? So same issue. Um, if you say in your policy you can only smoke in these areas, you don't need to allow people to smoke in the non-designated smoking areas regardless of disability. Now you can make your own policy, make exceptions, um, but again, if it's not allowed, it's not allowed. Legality. With regard to the dorm issue, since you're making new dorms, um, that's a Fair Housing Act and an ADA issue, so we're talking different pieces of legislation now. I get a lot of calls about this. Feel free to call anyway, because I'm getting fairly versed on fair housing <laughs> now. <laughs> so, another question for the class. This is more of a question, not a query. Back, still on marijuana, what about Edibles. Um, what do you think? There's multiple things here. I would think that they have a prescription that edibles might be okay because there's nothing being brought back out into the atmosphere that affects others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a guess. I don't know for sure. It's a guess. Yeah. 
I'm thinking that an employee might not be allowed to take it if uh, they're um, driving campus vehicles. Employee would not be able to take it if they're driving campus vehicles. Probably not. I don't think employees would be allowed to take it, period. No. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking the dorm situation. Yes, an employee would not, and an employee is a student. Um, I mean, regardless, because uh, we're, we're talking about students here. An employee, you're absolutely correct. It's, it's a federally illegal drug, and you are not obligated to allow an employee to have marijuana in their system because it's a Schedule One narcotic. Um, so regardless if it's legal in marijuana, or in Washington, excuse me. So that's like a whole other issue. I could do a whole presentation on that. <laughs> but you're absolutely correct. Um, and again, you can make your own policy. But as you stated, um, no smoke coming out, not um, a hazard with regard to smoke coming out um, to the health and safety of others. Um, so... I just left a blank answer because I was, <laughs> I was waiting to see what other people would say. Uh, you're absolutely correct. But um, another thing to consider, of course, and I'm sure you all have thought about this, is that, of course, we can, as we would in the employment setting, um, in, on campus and in the classroom and in the upcoming dorms, um, we can certainly take into consideration um, the conduct of any students, right, and staff if we're talking employment. So if someone is using marijuana or medical marijuana, um, and oftentimes now medical marijuana doesn't have anything that is going to affect your brain. You know, it's, it has no TBD in it. Um, but if it does and their conduct is not appropriate, you can always say, I don't care if it's for medical purposes. You cannot be in class right now. You cannot be using this. Um, in the dorms, you cannot be on the campus, of course, because your conduct needs to be appropriate as per our policy, right? Yes, Derek. In California, my last school was legal in the county, but not in the state, although California is what we have. In Washington, it's legal in the state, but because we received Title IV federal financial aid, um, we still have an obligation to enforce. I'm sorry. So you said because you, so it's, it's legal in the state, but you receive federal funding, so you have to enforce. Um, if we want to continue to receive federal aid for students, we have to enforce the law regarding marijuana. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's the case with almost all schools. Yeah. Exactly. And that is the case with almost all schools. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, and then, and that's the reason why I mentioned um, before about the employment situation because, you know, federally legal substance. So, absolutely. So there you go. There's your answer. Um, yeah. So, no marijuana here, probably. <laughs> it's a little bit under the rug, but whatever. We'll see. <laughs> so probably they won't be coming to you all with that question. So um, I didn't make that many slides because I thought people would be coming to us, uh, or coming to me rather, with some more specific scenarios. Um, did people have any specific questions? Um, anything related to the school, ADA related topics, um, whether program access, effective communication, um, anything like that, feel free to bring them up. I was just wanted to give an overview with regard to my slides. Could you go back to the slides where you had some examples so that you didn't actually read um, back further? It was under the definition of disabilities. Mary had a blog. There. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so, in the definition of disabilities, yeah, a little confusing. So, um, so number two, exists as a record um, or history. So here's an example. Ginger has been cancer free for 20 years and is considered cured. I say that in quotes because cancer, you don't want to say cured, right? Uh, after she applies for a job, someone on the hiring committee says that they remember hearing about Ginger's diagnosis 
and they are concerned that if they hire her, their insurance premiums will rise, so they do not hire Ginger. So they took a negative um, action against Ginger based on her record of having that disability, even though she does not currently have the disability of cancer. Uh, does that make sense to people, that number, that second prong? Okay. So then the third one, um, Lily has a slight stutter that does not impair her ability to perform any major life activities. Just has a stutter. Um, however, her employer assumes that she has an intellectual disability when the employer hears her stutter. And that as such, she cannot do her job. They assume that she can't do her job because she has an intellectual disability. So he subsequently demotes her. So again, the employer took a negative action because he was making an assumption that she has an intellectual disability and then because he thinks that she then cannot do her job. Also because he was just assuming that she has a disability because he heard a stutter. She might have one, she might not have one. So it's all about assumptions there, perceiving. Does that make sense? Um, if we don't have a student with a diagnosis on record in our classroom, does our classroom and the materials we give need to be accessible? Uh, well, if a person needs a reasonable um, accommodation or modification of policy and procedure, it's their responsibility to go to disability services and request that because you know, they're an adult, they're the student, and they're the ones that need to request that. So, I mean, you should say have, like, if you use videos or something, it would be most appropriate for those videos to be captioned and things like that and, and get ahead of that if you can so much. I know sometimes you'll be using, like, old videos and they probably won't be. Um, but you don't have a responsibility to get ahead of these things before um, somebody makes that request. You don't have to make an assumption, like, oh, I know how I have somebody who's deaf and, and I know they're going to need all these things. They need to do that. Is that true under Washington's recent, what is it, 188? Well, I think there's two different questions. One is doing any accommodation before a student is under the proper process to request it versus the specific question about accessible technology in the classroom or elsewhere on campus, which we are obligated to do by section by the way. Yes, yes. I mean, you do need to have accessible technology, true. Um, but, I mean, and like, you know, kind of like I was mentioning the, like the videos and audiobooks and, and those sort of things. And you, and you should have all those things available. But again, there, there's both responsibilities on the sides of the school and responsibilities on the sides of the students is, is sort of what I'm trying to emphasize there. Does that, does that sort of make sense, what I'm trying to say? I'm just getting a lot of mixed messages around sort of the refresh. So I was under the understanding from August forward that any new technology on campus needs to be accessible. Okay, yes. Yes, that, that is correct. When so you, if we okay. produce a Word document, if we have a video, if we use Canvas, all those instructional materials need to be ADA accessible. You are correct. You yes. Yes, so she said, um, from August forward, all documents, um, all technology that will be produced um, for in the classroom um, should be made accessible. So because that's different than doing it for like a specific student, that's something um, that it's, it's, that's different than like just making like a large print document for some student that you anticipate is going to need it. That's like saying, um, saying putting something on a website and making sure that it has alt tags or making sure that your website is uh, WCAG, um, you know, accessible or something like that. Uh, so, so, yeah, absolutely appropriate. All videos uh, have captioning, that kind of thing. So, yes, you're absolutely correct. You've got that right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I misunderstood your question. There's a thing about that. This is the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. But when we're talking about accessible online technology, 
especially, that's Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, different law. And the policies, um, the SBCTC policy and WATEC policy 188 gave a refresh, an update of what was already mandated by Section 508. We were already expected to comply with that, but now there's more urgency. <laughs> Yeah, there is. And um, all, all of that stuff, I mean, <clears throat> now that it's, uh, you know, just going forward, doing those things, learning about alt tagging and, and, and making things accessible, you know, you can certainly seek other resources to do those kind of things. But it's, it's more appropriate, and then it'll be just much easier once you get more students saying, OK, I just want to make sure that these documents, you know, will, be, will work with my screen reading software or whatever, so. Right, so in other words, um, just to kind of recap, everything that we put on Canvas, which is our learning management mm -hmm. system, yeah. should be in an accessible format. Mm -hmm. If it's a Word document, it should use styles. If it's a video, it should be closed caption. If it's a picture, it should have alt text. However, I do not have to have an interpreter standing by per chance that I get a student in class who needs one. That would be up to the student to ask Angela's office, mm -hmm. and if granted, they would take care of making those arrangements. Yes, yeah, so she said, just to recap, so anything that she would be putting on Canvas, the online program that you use, um, everything needs to be um, accessible using, say, styles, headings, alt tags, caption videos, et cetera, but you don't need to have an ASL interpreter just standing by just in case some person who happens to be deaf or hard of hearing wanders in someday. Absolutely correct. Yes, that's the responsibility of some student goes, visits Angela and says, I have a disability, I need an ASL interpreter in my class, and then you go and hire someone to do that. Right. Correct. Any other questions about that? I think someone back here had a, another question a while back. Yeah. Re regarding employment uh, for from you know employees at the school, um, I'm confused as to how. Um, so, what is a request? You say request. How formal does the request need to be? Verbal, in writing, a specific form, or just a simple email? <clears throat> how does the request need to be made so that it is in fact acted upon and not ignored? So are you talking about when employees get um, reasonable accommodations? Okay, so if an employee wants a reasonable accommodation, that would be under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act because it's a different sort of situation. Um, that could be made uh, verbally or on paper. Uh, some places have specific forms. And because you're a school, you probably do have a specific form to fill out. Um, I know, like, like I said, I'm at UW and they have a very extensive form to fill out, I'm aware. Um, so, um, but you know, you would probably go to some HR staff and, and say, I have a disability, I, I want a reasonable accommodation, and they would point you the right direction if you can't find it on the website or, or whatever. Um, and then basically, you would go through that process and then only the people with the need to know um, would go through that interactive process with you. And again, it would be the responsibility of the employee to um, start that reasonable accommodation process and work with whomever is in charge of that, whichever HR person or supervisor or whatever. Does that make sense? But you can certainly start the conversation with a verbal disclosure. And that's the only time a person would need to disclose their disability if you have a non-apparent disability. There's no need to disclose until they do want a reasonable accommodation, um, but obviously you need to say you have a disability or why would they give you an accommodation? Well, see, that's nothing. I, I thought that, um, and unfortunately people, whenever I bring that, people laugh at me because they think it's, I'm joking and I'm actually serious. I was under the impression that dwarf, dwarfism was covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. The, well, not dwarfism. Dwarfism? Oh, oh, yeah, oh no, is covered. Yeah, so for people of short stature, yeah, no, it's covered. Yeah, yeah, I talk about that in other presentations frequently. Yeah, I mean, but 
you know, it depends on what type of accommodation people might need. Um, it's one of the reasons that, you know, you want a lower counter, of course, right? Yeah, and then a lot of people who um, have like achondroplasia, which um, what we would call a lot of people who are of short stature, um, they have other co-occurring disabilities or comorbid disabilities, um, you know, heart problems, et cetera. Yeah, Derek. What's your current sense of, of where the law is with therapy as opposed to service animals? Well, um, so uh, Derek said, um, what is my impression of the difference with uh, service animals, trained service animals, and therapy animals? Okay, so under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, a service animal is a, a trained service animal. Uh, so in, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, that's considered, it's only a dog, right? Um, and then public entities and, and places of public accommodation do need to make reasonable accommodations for miniature horses also. In Washington state, a service animal is basically considered all animals um, any animal, literally. Fish, birds, goats. I'm trying to think. I have, I've literally heard any animal, anything. You wouldn't believe anything. Um, yeah, um, but counties, cities can make their own laws. So like the city of Seattle, it doesn't actually have the word trained in their definition. So, but you all are in shoreline, so that doesn't apply to you. And I don't think you have your own municipal definition. So I believe you still would go by the state definition. Trained, service animal, and animal. So, as I'm saying, Washington state definition, more broad than the federal definition. So we're going to go with that. So that's that definition. Therapy animal, um, not covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, because it just basically it's just considered a pet. Um, it's you know frequently used, prescribed by therapists, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists for um, anxiety, etc. Kind of thing. Um, it's a type of assistance animal under the Fair Housing Act um, and the Air Carrier Access Act. So there's a lot of confusion about it because there's conflicting definitions. Um, under other pieces of legislation. People will say, oh, but I can have this in my apartment under this definition, um, but not you know, when I go out in the world, when I go to a school or when I go to the supermarket. Well, you know, too bad. Um, however, you can certainly, again, make your own assistance animal or service animal policy here at school. So you can allow an untrained therapy animal here if you want to. Um, but you know, there's risk there. Then again, also, if you go into the employment arena, so that's, there we're talking about like Title II, Title III. When you talk about employees, if an employee uh, wants to request a reasonable accommodation to have an assistance animal, um, that's just any, like any other reasonable accommodation. Um, so like an ergonomic chair or a screen reader. So they could say, I want to bring my therapy animal, untrained, maybe trained, we don't know. Um, and then the employer, of course, has the ultimate last say to decide whether that would be reasonable. Um, so, you know, hopefully it would be, okay, not a fundamental alteration in the workplace, stays with the person, um, doesn't get too ratty, the person takes care of it, then the employer decides, okay, this will work in our workplace. So it's, again, case by case, kind of dependent on the situation. Most Schools probably would not be keen on a therapy animal in, uh, you know, hanging around campus. But it gets tricky, like when you start having dorms, because therapy animals would be allowed in the dorms, because that's a Fair Housing Act situation. But then you pop out into your classrooms, and you, you're not necessarily obligated to allow them in there. So that's why it's very, very important to have a separate service animal policy. Right. On the topic of pets, it sort of begs the question about if it's a reasonable accommodation for that individual, 
but maybe somebody else who's in the same class has an allergy. And now that person's yeah. ability to learn and participate in class is affected. So how does that balance out? Right, right. I get that question every single time we talk about this. <laughs> Literally. I'm generally curious. No, I totally understand because it's a very, very good question. So the question was, um, uh, if you're you're trying to accommodate somebody you know somebody asked to have a service animal in the classroom um, but there's another uh, student in the classroom who has an allergy or something in that classroom and so then that uh, is detrimental to their ability to learn or something like that so ideally of course you'd you'd hope that you could be able to accommodate both people's disabilities so say um, you know this young lady uh, brings in her dog uh, Derek over here is allergic to dogs and we can you know keep them as far away from each other and that is all right and Derek doesn't get sick from the dog and, and she has her dog and she's okay with that. Sometimes that doesn't work, sometimes the allergy is so significant that they can't even be in the same room and then we have to figure out a different way to do that. Um, that is usually solvable because most people don't have um, that bad of animal allergies that they can't literally be in the same room together. Um, the same thing happens with people who are really, really afraid of animals, dogs. Um, but, um, so it's usually solvable, but you know, we can kind of work around it. Um, you generally cannot say, no, you can't bring in your service animal because somebody's afraid or somebody's allergic, or vice versa. So you want to try to accommodate both people in some way. Yeah. And that's exactly what I've in a couple of years. They had seats. Yeah, yeah. So that's what he said. So he solved that problem by assigning seats. Mm -hmm. Any other situations? All right. Let me just go back to the end. So this is my contact information. I mentioned the phone number, 800-949-4232. You can email our general email, nwadactr at uw.edu. Uh, our website is nwadacenter.org, or you can email me directly, levym at uw.edu. And like I said, my cards are back there. Yeah. What, yeah, what happened there? <laughs> I can't see that. Oh, yeah, because it turned into a link. Oh. Sorry. Remember okay. contrast yes, like we were talking yes, about? Yes. We were having a discussion about how contrast is really important. And... Uh, Blue on blue is not contrast, not accessible. So anyway, again, my email, L-E-V-Y-M, as in Miranda, at uw.edu. Another reason to read out loud. <laughs> yes, and grab a card. Um, also, please do remember to fill out your evaluations. If you didn't grab one, they're in the back. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback. I just always want to make my presentations um, you know, top drawer and uh, gather data and what have you. And I'll, there's a sign-in sheet in the back also, please. So um, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask or come to me later. Uh, and thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you.